आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to yet another friday episode of all things policy today we're going to be talking about the portuguese um not necessarily an aspect of the portuguese that is very well known but something different something about how the portuguese um actually influenced india uh, as a people in social cultural and economic terms um all of us are familiar with all the great titans of uh, portuguese history as it were uh, the vasco da gama as the albuquerques uh, the conquerors the warlords uh the ones who were involved in india's arms trades and wars um but there was also uh hundreds thousands hundreds of thousands um of other portuguese and their descendants who really shaped the kind of languages that india spoke the kind of art that india sees the kind of vocabulary that a lot of indian peoples um up till very recently and in some ways even up till today continue to have um i have with me today aditya ramanathan and karthik mali hi guys hi hey anirudh So Aditya as as you know is is the co-host of, of a military history podcast that I host um we've talked in some detail about how the portuguese got into the indian ocean karthik mali is a friend of mine um, he's a researcher and a writer um, and an amateur linguist and he's going to be uh, telling us a lot of interesting research that he's been doing uh, about the portuguese in india uh, ranging from their influence on um, printed languages in india to pineapples um, and of course to um, indo portuguese creoles um, so let's get started aditya over to you can you tell us a little bit uh, just for general context can you tell us a little bit about what the portuguese of all people uh, western european people uh, were doing in india how did they end up there how did they really impact uh, the subcontinent's political history uh, sure thanks anirudh uh, yeah the story of the portuguese in india is quite an unlikely one portugal is a small impoverished kingdom the southwest prow of europe but uh, they did face out in, into the atlantic ocean and uh, they had developed over the, over centuries a maritime culture and it was in the late 15th century of course uh, that the portuguese uh, finally found a sea route uh, to india uh, this is this was of course led by vasco da gama a name we all know from uh, school history books and over the course of the 16th century the 1500s the portuguese uh, slowly consolidated their power uh, in the indian ocean region and uh, they were able to harness the spice trade uh, remember at this time the spice trade was dominated by land powers and uh, by finding a sea route the portuguese were able to uh, get into this lucrative trade and uh, the portuguese kingdom for a brief time uh, became very rich the portuguese estate in india was also focused around goa and uh, goa became throughout through the 16th century a fairly wealthy place uh, you know the great renaissance era churches that you see in goa are built with uh, the local red laterite rock you know it's it's a unique style of architecture uh, comes from this period but what is really interesting is that in no time the portuguese were supplanted by other european powers first the dutch and later the french and the english you know the danish a lot of other people uh, came in to get their own slice of this pie and uh, you see portugal's relative power and its wealth uh, decline and the portuguese really become just another power in the indian ocean specifically the western indian ocean but this is also a period where there is a rich uh, cultural exchange where you see uh, the impact of portugal on indian culture what i think is really important for us to just understand is that the portuguese presence in the subcontinent began before the, the era of the moguls uh, about 15 years before the era of the moguls and it continued until 1961 perhaps within the lifetime of some of our listeners so that's that's how long lived this presence was and it's not surprising that it had a profound effect on india's culture uh i'd i'd also just add that you know while we do know about portugal mo- mostly through these naval exploits in the 16th century and through perhaps the inquisition which also took place at the same time even lay people like me know that there are some portuguese loan words that we use uh without really thinking you know pau for instance from pau bhaji or kima pau uh, pau is very much a uh portuguese word uh, there are other words that are probably of portuguese origin balti in hindi for bucket uh, probably comes from portuguese so you know there is obviously a clear 
cultural exchange and a linguistic exchange going on. Uh, but I, you know, I would like to ask Karthik really, uh, because he's the expert on this. How has, uh, <laughs> right. how have the Portuguese influenced Indian languages? So, um, that's a good question, Aditya. Like, um, and, and you're absolutely right in saying that. Portuguese uh, presence, as it were, in the subcontinent or specifically what is now India was easily the longest of any European, um, you know, presence, you know, uh, country that is like uh, it was four centuries, uh, over four centuries, I think. Yeah, for over four and a half centuries. So when they arrived, it's also important to keep in mind that when the Portuguese arrived in India, they were still, um, you know, they still had formidable foes among local kingdoms and the like, which meant that, you know, they, they didn't have um, complete dominance just yet. And um, a lot of their presence was also in many ways fragmentary or it was also subject to like political, you know, um, developments. And for example, if you look at Kochi, which they captured and then they ruled for a while, uh, Kochi was quickly taken over by the Dutch. And, um, despite that, you know, you have these markers of, uh, Portuguese heritage in Kochi. For example, the St. Francis Church, uh, which was one of the earliest churches built, uh, in South Asia, in all of South Asia. And it was also where Vasco da Gama was buried, uh, briefly, you know, before they, before his body was moved to, uh, Lisbon. Uh, what's interesting is, you know, across its empire, and not just in India, uh, the Portuguese often intermarried with local, you know, like local uh, locals, right? Wherever they went, in Africa, in uh, in the Americas, uh, in China, you know, uh, but also in India. That's, yeah, it's quite an interesting point, Karthik. I remember while I was reading this book about the Battle of Plassey, right? Um, apparently, there were quite a few. Um, what what the British called black Portuguese right, um, who right. were living in, in their in, in their fort in in Calcutta, um, and and these were very obviously uh, probably descendants of, of Portuguese men who were married Indian women right. um, looked and sp- uh, looked like Indians probably spoke some variety of an Indian language but were Catholic. Um, so yeah, the, the the Portuguese, the Portuguese and the Spanish were a little different from the English and the French in terms of how they actually sought uh, to assimilate and intermarry with the population. Absolutely, and it's it's uh, it's it's interesting you bring up the example of uh, Bengal as well because um, even though you know their presence was primarily uh, along the west coast, the city of Hooghly, which is fairly close, I uh, I think, to Kolkata was actually founded by renegade Portuguese pirates. So not all of these pirates were under the direct jurisdiction of Lisbon. Some of them were literally just renegades who were acting on their own and, you know, free agents as it were. And um, they even swelled their ranks by intermarrying. And, you know, basically you had like um, descendants of these pirates, um, you know, mixed race descendants who then, um, you know, like expanded the frontiers of, you know, their piracy. And uh, uh, there's even a word in Bengali, as I understand it. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting the pronoun, uh, pro- you know, like if I'm pronouncing it right. I think it's harmada, but it's you know, very clearly from the Portuguese word armada for like a naval fleet, and it means like oh, that's you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it, it armada. Like, yeah, it means like rascal or uh, uh, like you know, <laughs> uh, lumpen, you know, proletariat type. You know, something like that. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't speak Bengali, but yeah, it has like negative connotations from what I'm told. And, uh, interesting. So you're telling us about how, um, I mean, before we moved on to this tangent, right? You're talking about how uh, they tend to settle down, intermarry. Right. Um, I'm assuming that there's, there was also as traders, right? Since they were bringing in stuff from all across the world. Right. Um, there was a lot of, material exchange with with Indian societies and polities. I mean, gunpowder is one is the thing they're most familiar with. Um, But I I think people often underestimate just how globalized uh, the world of the 16th, 17th century was. 
Uh, one really interesting example that I came across was that the Taj Mahal was probably at least partially paid for with silver that came from Peru um, because the Spanish were, were mining out um, stuff, stuff in Peru using former Incas uh, who, who were enslaved um, and they were paying for um, Indian produce using uh, silver coins uh, and those inevitably would have found their ways into Mughal coffers and thence into paying for the Taj Mahal. So that's, that's just fascinating. So I'm sure there are examples of, of this happening with the Portuguese as well. Absolutely. Like, um, you know, like if you, um, so, uh, like Aditya said, when the Portuguese first arrived on the scene, uh, the Mughals were not yet the face of India, so to speak, right? So they encountered local polities, most notably in Malabar, obviously, uh, where you had multiple such polities, but also further north. Um, uh, for example, Goa, which, you know, was their flagship colony, so to speak, uh, up until 1961, was um, actually conquered from Bijapur, the Bijapur Sultanate, and not, um, you know, like, let's say the Marathas or, yeah, who weren't even on the scene at the time. But uh, Goa was actually conquered, for, uh, it was conquered after conflict with Bijapur, and Goa was actually an important Bijapuri port, and it even has, like, um, you know, remnants of uh, Bijapuri architecture, like, you know, the oldest mosque in Goa is uh, a Bijapuri construction. So, you know, the Portuguese uh, set up Goa as, you know, as a trading hub as well. And what happened was, um, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of this trade was into, with Bijapur, right? And with Golconda, the two primary, uh, powers of the Deccan at the time, right? And, uh, this also happened around the time of the Colombian exchange, right? And since Portugal controlled Brazil in South America, a lot of what made its way to India is American in a broader sense, but also very specifically Brazilian. For example, pineapples. And this is even reflected in the names we use for these. For example, uh, the word for pineapple in many Indian languages is ananas, uh, including Kannada and Hindi. So ananas is actually from a Tupi word and Tupi is an indigenous language of Brazil, which became, you know, which ended up became, uh, becoming like a lingua franca, uh, in a simplified form. Um, so the Colombian exchange happened uh, roughly around the same time. And, uh, a lot of this exchange was with the primary powers of the Deccan at the time, including, I mean, mostly Vijapur and Golconda. And, uh, although the Colombian exchange is seen as, you know, like it's, it's broadly an American process, right? But since the Portuguese ruled Brazil, it was more specifically an India, uh, an Indian Brazilian sort of connection. Yeah. In, in, in the Indian context, right? So, uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of names of like these vegetables come from Brazilian indigenous languages, like, um, ananas, uh, and a range of Indian languages comes from Tupi, which is uh, a Brazilian language, right? And what happened was these, uh, you know, these crops were so, so fascinating to the, to local elites, right? And they were seen as luxury crops and like luxury vegetables and stuff to the extent where pineapples, uh, start showing up as architectural motifs across the mausoleums of local rulers, local sultans. For example, the Gol Gumbaz has pineapple motifs in Bijapur. The Qutub Shahi tombs of that period have, um, pineapple motifs in Golconda. And then you have other, you know, you have a bunch of other structures with these motifs. I think even the Charmanar has them. I'm not sure about that, but. That is just so fascinating. I mean, if you try to, if you try to like string together all the events that had to happen in order for pineapples to appear his tomb, <laughs> some dude called yeah. Cristobal Colon, right. who was a failed mariner and who thought he was sailing to India, uh, accidentally right. ended up discovering the new right. world, proceeded to genocide and enslave uh, most of the Caribbean, <laughs> thus facilitating an age of European expansion, which ended uh, with the Portuguese discovering both Brazil and India. And then this exchange, which is named after this failed mariner, Christopher Columbus, uh, this exchange of goods. From all across the world, right? right. And, um, in fact, something, something as um, ubiquitous in Indian cuisine as the potato um, is a product of this kind of uh, Colombian exchange. It, it's, a, it's a result of contact between the old and new worlds that happened because uh, of European activity in this period. 
Um, so that's fascinating. But there's another deeper angle to the Portuguese involvement in India, right, Karthik? So it isn't just about um, loan words in particular Indian languages, but in a lot of cases, there's much deeper linguistic contact that happens uh, because, as you said, they're one of the longest lasting colonial powers in India. So how exactly did that happen? What What is a deeper linguistic interaction um, between two different peoples actually entail? So I'm just going to take a small detour from this. From, from the question of language uh, as an entity to something that's related, right? So um, if you think of printing, right, in India, across Indian languages, we, we think of it as a given, right? But um, it's essentially a technology and like how, you know, like technologies arise in different parts of the world. We didn't have printing when the Europeans made contact with us, right? And uh, it was actually the Portuguese who brought printing as we know it to India. Right. And um, the first book that was printed in an Indian language was printed in Tamil. And it was a Christian tract. I mean, most of these were, you know, essentially Christian tracts uh, for their own benefit. But, you know, they were still they, they still constitute significant linguistic examples of, you know, of language and use. And also, more importantly, like tech, uh, technological breakthroughs, because, I mean, there was no such thing as a book in Tamil. Right. But um, this happened quite early on. And in fact, the first book that was printed in India, so this was printed in Lisbon, the Tamil book. Uh, and then it was, you know, it was brought um, to India by missionaries and, and the like. But the first that is book, fascinating. The first printed book that India saw had been printed in Lisbon. Yeah. <laughs> fascinating. And, and shortly afterwards, so this happened in 1554 CE. And shortly afterwards, two years later, in fact, 1556 CE, you had the first book printed in India, right? And this was printed in Goa because, you know, Goa was their, um, you know, their, their most stable colony and their largest, and most prosperous. But, you know, like you, you started having, uh, you know, you had print in Goa and it became a bigger thing. So this was the first time print had ever been used in an Indian context. And, and like, you know, you wouldn't think of Goa as like some sort of printing, um, printing hub, printing innovator. You know, it, it started picking up speed. And what happened was local missionaries started writing tracts in, uh, in local languages to, uh, you know, like process of conversion. But, um, you, you have a lot of these books that start coming out. And most of these, uh, date back to this period. And, um, you know, like it's it just, it's, it, it's, it's hard to overstate how important the printed word is, right? I mean, you, you can't imagine life without printing, but, just like how we see a lot of uh, things related to Indian uh, language as um, constant or unchanging or ancient, it's actually not all that old, uh, right? 1556, I mean, many centuries ago, but it's, I mean, if you think of Indian literature as something that's been around for, you know, for, for many centuries, right? You have classic works of Kannada literature from like, you know, 600, 700 years prior to that. This is This is relatively late in a sense, right? And, um, you know, like the Portuguese actually, um, uh, so they, they were also the first to develop types, typefaces for Indian languages, right? Because they needed to be able to type, uh, you know, like print these Indian scripts. So that was another contribution they brought. Obviously, it was varied for like, you know, different languages. Uh, they did it first with Tamil and, um, I think Devanagari came later for like Marathi and Konkani of, uh, of Goa. But, uh, this was another innovation they brought which is, you know, like, I would say it's overlooked today. Um, in fact, Goa has, if you go to Goa, you know, you have, like, many archives and, like, many, uh, you know, samples or, or, like, many artifacts from this period. So, uh, and this brings me to the next point, right? When, you know, when you had these communities, uh, yes, you had loanwords from, uh, you know, from Portuguese into these languages, but more importantly, uh, as we said, like, you know, as we were discussing earlier, you had intermarriages. Uh, and what happened was these mixed race, uh, communities, uh, didn't speak Portuguese as their native language. Uh, but they also identified as, you know, they, they identified with a certain European, uh, I guess, broader identity, right? So they would have been, uh, you, you know, they would be Catholics and they would adopt European mannerisms and whatnot. But, um, they didn't speak Portuguese. So they were not seen as, and, you know, as you put it, black Portuguese. So they weren't seen as full Portuguese and this sort of reflected in their language as well. They spoke what are called Creole languages, 
which are basically languages that arise when, you know, like different communities or rather one community uh, learns the language of a dominant community and like uh, they, they end up speaking it with heavy influence from their own language, right? And this sort of becomes fossilized. So uh, you would have, you know, uh, inevitably uh, a Creole language would involve like grammatical simplification where, you know, like verb conjugations are simplified and you only have like one verb form or, you know, complex, uh, like irregular verbs are, you know, uh, they disappear and, you know, like nouns are irregular plurals are, you know, normalized and stuff like that, right? That's quite interesting. And and what, what immediately comes to mind is stuff like Hinglish or Tinglish, for example. Right. Um, which, again, uh, I mean, I don't think that they've fundamentally changed that much grammatically. Yes. Uh, but there's certainly more influence than merely a, a borrowing of loan words. You know, um, I, I think one great example is um, in Bangalore, like saying, come off. Right. Um, or, or put off, you know, that that kind of thing. Right. Um, so you're basically saying that Indo-Portuguese Creoles are that except like on steroids because you have like <laughs> uh, this entire society of people across generations doing something like this. Yeah, you could say that. And like, you know, and, and also keep in mind that this would be their first language, right? This would be something that they'd speak socially, they'd speak, um, you know, amongst themselves and in uh, all aspects of their life, right? So it, it wasn't just something that they'd speak to with friends or, you know, like something socially and like, yeah, so this was, uh, this was, yeah, this was pretty much their linguistic universe, so to speak. And, uh, I mean, Portuguese written, formal, standard Portuguese was used for formal, uh, purposes, for example, rel- uh, religion and, you know, perhaps formal writing. But, uh, in their, you know, everyday lives and in, like, the community life, this is what would have been used. And obviously, like, um, you know, you would have different creoles because, you know, you would have different influences in different communities. So you actually have, or had, um, to put it more accurately, a string of Creoles, right? Spoken from pretty much like Daman all the way down south to, um, I think Kochi or maybe a little further south. So, you know, like, uh, Bombay itself, right? And Bombay was ruled by the Portuguese for quite a while before it was given as dowry to uh, England. But, uh, Bombay actually had, was home to a host of, um, of Indo-Portuguese Creoles, right? That's, I never really thought of that. I mean, I, I knew that it, it was the dowry of what, Catherine de Baganza when she married the second, but it never occurred to yeah. me that there was a Indo-Portuguese Creole there uh, that was, was that basically existed alongside whatever else the English were bringing. Right. That's fascinating. Uh, what's also fascinating to me is that you have all, you have Portugal, you have the Portuguese language interacting with a variety of Indian languages. So I'm guessing that the way the, the new forms that the Creole takes and the new forms that the loan words take must be different in every language. And also what words get loaned must also say something about the interaction of those specific communities uh, with the Portuguese, right? Absolutely. Like if you look at, um, you know, if you look at the Creole spoken in what is now Kerala, so, you know, um, you, you had like the Talasheri Creole, the Kannur Creole, and um, quite a few actually. And like you had the um, Kochi Creole most uh, famously, the uh, Kochi Creole only died out like a few decades ago. Uh, the last speaker died fairly recently in our lifetimes, right? So it lasted, um, you know, like over four centuries, right? And uh, these Creoles, including the Creole spoken in Sri Lanka, showed a lot more Dravidian influence, you know, uh, and yeah, their, their sentence patterns and whatnot were, were aligned more on those lines. Whereas the ones spoken in Bombay and like its Enderons were more, you know, like Indo-Aryan influence, right? Since Marathi was the local language, Marathi and company were the local languages. So that did affect the Creoles as well and the way, you know, they were shaped. And the thing is, Creoles had low social prestige because they were seen as, like, you know, the elites as not Portuguese enough and, you know, like, others as foreign or whatever. So they tended to die out, sadly, right? That's what happened. Bombay was actually home, or or rather the larger Bombay area was home to a large variety of Creoles. You had the Banjra Creole, the Mahim Creole, the Kurla Creole. That is crazy. Uh, the one, Amazing. Yeah, yeah, you had one because, yeah, because all of these were villages, right? I mean, now they're just like, you know, part of this amorphous greater Bombay, but back then they were just like independent villages or towns. So you had the Tane Creole, the Basai Creole. 
but uh, that's just amazing. Yeah, and they were spoken well into the 1900s because, uh, or, or at least the early 1900s, because um, a German uh, a German um, scholar actually records them from that period, like I think the 1910s or so. But he says, you know, they're already on the decline, and they're only spoken by like you know, like around a few thousand people each. You know, so it you know they they died out only in the last century. But um, yeah, you had like this explosion of uh, linguistic contact across the West Coast primarily, and it didn't end there either. Like I said, these communities use Portuguese as their formal language. So you actually, in some of the more prosperous communities, you actually have Portuguese writings, uh, you know, like throughout, like um, or rather, like through the um, uh, uh, up until like British rule, like Portuguese was used for um, religious tracts. It was used for um, you know. Uh, some community documents as well. This is still like, you know, it's not, it's, it's still like, um, being researched. So we don't really know much about this yet, but you do have samples of these, uh, writings in like some of the bigger cities like Bombay. You know, Bombay even hosted, it, it even had, uh, a Portuguese printing, um, industry for a while. Uh, it even had like a Portuguese newspaper for, for a few years. So, um, and in the 1800s, but, um, I mean, but that didn't really have much readership. All right. So I just want to ask, what is the status of these Creole languages today? Do any of them still exist? Do people still speak them? And what are some of the other Creole languages that do exist in India today? So um, it's a good question because, uh, like I said, um, these Creoles tended to have low social prestige and their communities were quite small to begin with, right? And they were not dominant either. So what happened was uh, a lot of these fields started dying out. Like in Bombay, it's recorded uh, because, um, you know, like the this German scholar I spoke of says that, you know, they're already on the decline when he wrote, you know, his uh, um, his observations. But um, I, I think there was another German scholar. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure it was the same guy, but um, in... Um, in the Malabar, he said something similar, you know, like these fields are dying out and like there are hardly like a handful of speakers left. Um, so interestingly enough, these Creoles, I mean, you know, like they had the longest, um, you know, like longevity in, in, in regions where, um, in regions of isolation. For example, the fishing village of Korlai, which is, you know, like it's, it's not famous at all, but it's this nondescript village outside, uh, Alibag, right? It's like, I think a couple of hours from Alibag, which is across the, um, you know, across the sea from Bombay. It still has a community of uh, Creole speakers, Creole Portuguese speakers. Uh, it, it, it's a very small community. Uh, I don't think it numbers over 5,000 people or like even uh, if even that. And uh, they still speak Korlai uh, Creole Portuguese to this very day, although it's under considerable linguistic stress from, um, you know, like from, from Marathi, right? Uh, because, you know, the community as a Catholic community lived in isolation from the others and they had their own religious life, their own social life and, you know, their own economic life. So they managed to keep this language intact. It's pretty fascinating because it's, it's like this unknown village, right? But it's managed to keep this linguistic heritage of many centuries. So that's one island of, uh, that's, that, that was one, I mean, it's one island of Portuguese girl that we have today. Uh, you do have speakers in Daman. But, uh, um, again, it's, it's on the decline there. And, uh, you had, uh, you had Creole Portuguese in, um, Kochi as well. But it, you know, the last speaker died, uh, a few decades ago. And, uh, I, from what I'm, from what I read online, there are locals, many locals who don't speak it natively, but they can speak it conversationally, right? Or they, uh, they, they can understand it because they grew up with it, right? And even like the families of these speakers, because um, people, you know, they would have switched to English or Malayalam or, you know, these other languages. But like um, these speakers or rather these heritage speakers, as they're called, still, uh, you know, they, they still carry a passive understanding of um, Kochi, Portuguese Creole. And um, I think uh, the local government has also like, I think they have a project to like document this history. But yeah, like sadly, thanks to the fragmentary nature of these communities and you know their status in society it's it's a little hard to trace their um, their history uh and apart from portuguese creoles you uh the, the most um, significant creole in india 
in numerical terms, but also political terms, is Nagamese, which is spoken in Nagaland, right? And uh, it's interesting because the various Naga tribes speak mutually unintelligible languages, right? So, you know, people have this tendency to look at Northeastern states and communities as monoliths. But uh, Nagaland actually, you know, has a, it's, it's very linguistically diverse. And um, the various tribes use Nagamese for inter-ethnic communication. And Nagamese is uh, a Creole based on Assamese, you know. And Assamese was introduced to the region as a trade language, right? So it ended up becoming an inter-ethnic language because it was intelligible to all communities. So it's, yeah, so they're essentially, so Nagamese is essentially an Assamese-based Creole. And it's so important in the region that, um, you know, like monkey bat, uh, in, um, you know, like the local, I mean, the local version of it or whatever is in Nagamese and you even have, so AIR Kohima has Nagamese broadcasts. So it's the only Creole language in India that I can think of that has like some political um, presence and usage, right? Institutional usage rather. Well, I mean... I had no idea that this was happening in the Northeast as well. Like, even though, like, I knew that these were all distinct languages, um, the, when you just connect to the dots, um, and as to how it's actually happening, that is just fascinating. And it's, it's interesting also that there are still speakers of an Indo Portuguese Creole. And it just, it just tells you, um, how old a lot of these, um, interconnections and language that we take for granted in India really are. It's very easy to, to, to say, Hey, this is an Indo Portuguese Creole because it stands out as something that is from far away from, away from the subcontinent coming in and intermingling, right? But if you look at other things as well, if you look at the way that, um, languages, uh, like Marathi, for example, kind of evolved, um, you're again looking at things that happened because of sustained contact between different peoples who were moving around the subcontinent, um, and therefore evolved from there, not necessarily as a Creole, but as a distinct language. But it still really is uh, very interesting to see. And on that note, um, thank you, Karthik. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we always look forward to, um, the way that you managed to unpack India's fascinating linguistic history for us. Um, I highly recommend to all of our listeners that you should check out Karthik's work. Uh, we'll put a link to his social media handles um, in, in the description for this podcast. Um, and if you're interested in the Portuguese's military history in India, um, I would suggest that you check out um, the Yudha podcast that Aditya and I have recorded together, uh, which we'll also link to in the description. Um, on that note, um, thank you so much, Karthik, for joining us. Thanks, Anirudh and Aditya for having me. One could have it. Uh, it's, it's our pleasure, always. Um, and um, thank you all for listening to All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, Check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And speaking of Instagram, Niharika Pandey joined Cyrus this week on Cyrus Says. Niharika is the strategic partner manager for Instagram India. Great conversation about the plans for Instagram in India. Karanjit Kaur joined the guys at Uncle Please Sit. Another really interesting conversation about the patriarchy. On Advertising is Dead, old friend Suchita Salwan showed up. Suchita is the founder of LBB. Great conversation she had with Varun. Definitely do check that out as well. Tanvi Lad, who is a nationally ranked badminton player, was on the Habit Coach with Ashton Doctor. Great conversation. I would highly, highly recommend that. The Football Shit Wall guys are back. They've been back for a few weeks, but definitely do check out their latest episode. Great, great conversation they had. On Aditi Surana's Absolutely Right, Manju Sara Rajan was the guest. And again, a great conversation was to be had over there. As always, great conversations all across the board. Check out some of the other stuff like Smile India, Know Your Kanun, and All Things Policy. All of them had fresh episodes this week. But with that, I hope to see you again next week. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, a show that talks money. 
on my show i speak to experts from every field of money and finance from stock markets equities debt funds credit cards life insurance every possible area of money and finance that you can think of we even did an episode on cryptocurrency i've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere robo advisory startups just name it we've got it at paisa paisa we help you make smart decisions about money you work hard for money now make your money work hard for you new episodes out every monday and you can listen to my show on the ivm podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have